Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Emerald Planet. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee. Hemp. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for the thousand best practices, the technology, services, and products as we move through the 21st century. And what we're gonna be talking about is the new ecological designs and the way that we're looking at the world through very different eyes in order to save the planet and at the same time to meet a population base by 2050 of some nine billion people and maybe 12 to 13 billion by the end of the century. And we don't want to just put people that are populating the globe, but at the same time to give them a standard and quality of life where they can actually thrive and not just survive. And we have a gentleman is going to be telling us all about that. He's been working, actually two gentlemen. I have one sitting right beside me in the studio. Uh, we have Dr. Philip. He goes by Phil Hawes. He's an architect of the Biosphere 2, which is uh, very, very famous. He's coming in uh, by Skype and telephone with a special guest right beside me who's been with us before. This is Christopher Zaloff, award-winning filmmaker, developer, first eco-district in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And uh, welcome for being with us, Chris. A pleasure. I'm glad to have you with us. And uh, Phil, I think you're with us. I'm uh, with you in spirit. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, we welcome you. Uh, say, uh, tell us a little bit about your background as far as an architect. And you have a designation I've not seen before, SFIA. What does that stand for and the significance of that in the architectural and design world? Uh, SFIA is the school I worked with, the San Francisco Institute of Architecture. I've worked with them for over 20 years at different times. And uh, that, uh, so that's what SFIA stands for. And it's a very uh, modern, but not just modern, but it's uh, dedicated to organic architecture and organic city planning, town and regional planning. That's wonderful. Tell us a little bit about your architectural background from the academic area, and then we're gonna get into the biosphere. You sent some incredible photographs and we're really looking at this as something that has happened, but actually you were designing then beyond the horizon. We want to talk about some of those designs, and we're going to be sharing that uh, with our audience. Okay. Well, uh, my background is I went to the University of Oklahoma when Bruce Goff was there. Bruce Goff was a very famous organic architect. I also had the opportunity to spend a year at Talius and, uh, when Mr. Wright, Mr. Frank Lloyd Wright, was still alive. And that was a very pivotal uh, point in my education. Then I spent 20 years working with a group of people who did nothing but ecological projects around the world. And uh, so that was uh, kind of put the cap sheaf on the whole thing. Well, looking at this design here, this is absolutely incredible. Looking at this, it looks like something that probably should be on the moon or maybe even further beyond. Uh, but it's a mixture of uh, very old and ancient designs out of the Middle East, North Africa, and then, of course, uh, very modern designs at the same time. Tell us what we're actually looking at in this footprint. Well, I assume that it's Biosphere 2. I don't see the slides Correct. Here, but, yeah, that's, uh, the Biosphere 2 was designed to uh, essentially make a salute to the past, uh, the pyramid architecture of the world, the Great Pyramids, of course, the Step Pyramid in Egypt, which was the first pyramid, the pyramids of Central and South America, and uh, then the, the vaulted uh, structure, which is the agriculture, is uh, that was uh, that that refers back to the southern part of Iraq, where the people there lived in have lived in marshes for something like five or six thousand years, and. Um, they, they built their houses by bundling marsh uh, reeds together, bending them over and tying them together at the top and uh, making these cylindrical vault systems. Then the part of the biosphere that looks a little avant-garde, a little bit modern and spacey, that, that's uh, more thinking in the future. 
and those those shapes are more rockety, I guess you would say. <laughs> but at any rate, so it was a combination of, of referring to and honoring the past and also thinking about the future when we put that together. But the um, Now looking uh, at this uh, location, uh, Phil, uh, it's surrounded by uh, high mountains and it looks like a high desert plain, but yet you wanted the Biosphere 2 to be totally independent, off the grid, and producing its own food, energy, water, and, and uh, all the basic needs of, of humankind. So tell us how you uh, bundled all of that together in this uh, one living uh, building and uh, complex. Well, actually, uh, it isn't off the grid. Uh, we wanted to take it off the grid, but at that time, uh, 1985, the uh, technology for solar cells is not what it is today. The wind is not uh, substantial there enough. So we we used uh, natural gas to, uh, to do the energy for it. But it's the people inside. It's not so much how we provided the cooling and heating for it, but the people inside grew their own food and uh, they were living sealed up for a period of two years. There were eight, eight people, eight individu individuals inside there for two years. And uh, it was um, to see if uh, actually we had advanced to the point where we could design something where people could actually close it up and go inside with 3,800 other species and, and uh, live and survive. Yeah, that's, uh, that's absolutely incredible. And I'm showing this of uh, the uh, snow, and then I'm going to let Chris ask a question. But uh, this was really to be something that was 24-7, 365. What did you include in this that allowed this to uh, be able for people to exist in a very high heat and a low humidity at many times, but yet you're here in the midst of a snowstorm and still, I would assume you're very comfortable inside, and uh, things were going on as normal. Well, we had we had 26 uh, air handling units inside there that were putting out 50,000 cubic feet a minute, and some of them had cooling coils, and some of them had heating coils, and so we we were able to adjust the temperature and uh, in different parts of the structure to suit whether it was in the agricultural part or in the desert or in the rainforest. So uh, we also were able to rain and create the humidity in different places at different times. It was, it's all that sort of thing is pretty much off the shelf in a way, it just would never been done before all in one place at one time. We didn't do anything that was, well, we did a few things that were unusual, but most of what we did was pretty much off the shelf, but nobody had ever done it before and we felt that it was the sort of thing that needed to be brought together and, and done all in one place to see if it was possible to build a, a regenerative system that was closed off from this planet. Okay, well I'm showing some of these uh, designs here and now we have the uh, superstructure, I believe this was the living area. Chris, won't you ask a question? All right, Dr. Phil, good to hear your voice. I wonder if you can talk about how the principles of Biosphere 2 can be applied to sustainable communities and the challenge of 2018, because that was uh, 20 yeah. years ago, 30 years ago. Yeah, uh, actually, I learned a great deal out of that, and we all did, in terms of uh, how easy it is. It, it takes energy, but it's quite easy to recycle water and uh, living systems provide the, the uh, purification for the air inside. And uh, so it, it's, um, whenever I hear about towns that have run out of water, I, I have to chuckle because the truth of the matter is there's plenty of water. It's just that they have to bite the bullet and say, okay, we're gonna have to pay for this. We can do this, we can recycle, we can pull it back out of the atmosphere, we can do all sorts of, there are many, many things you can do to recycle water and to reclaim water. So, um, but you do have to pay for it. It takes energy and it takes money. So this is this is what people are not really willing to do. They want to be able to sink a hole in the ground and say, hey, we've got it and we're going to keep it. And they, if we need more, we'll just get more out of the ground. And that's just not the way the world is set up. Uh, Philip, uh, we're looking at now the uh, green area as far as these uh, number of plants. I think they're not only as far as uh, a food source decoration, but also air purification and maybe even adding to the internal 
uh, transpiration for rain. Tell us about these plants that we're looking at and the systems that you use. And we have to be quick. We only have about two minutes left. Well, you may be looking at the wastewater treatment system. I'm not sure. Correct. That, That's all right. Anyway, exactly. It, it was a bioremediation system that was used to clean all the sewage inside, both the human beings and the animals they had. And uh, that, that's a, uh, it's called bioremediation because it's biology is doing the purification of the wastewater. And it, yes, it is evapotranspiring water into the atmosphere. And then that water is being reclaimed through these, co these uh, air handlers I told you about. There's the, the cold water uh, coils would be condensing water out of the atmosphere. And it was being recycled around. So we were raining and we were collecting the water out of the atmosphere that had gone through the plant life as it was purifying the wastewater. Yeah, no, we have up, uh, this is the rainforest uh, area of all this. I tell you, it looks like something you'd actually see in the, the Amazonian jungle or maybe even uh, in the equatorial Congo or somewhere like it that. Was an Ama it, was, it was an Amazonian rainforest. Is what yeah, I tell you, it's, uh, it, it's amazing. Now we're looking at, looks like some uh, production crops and what about food production uh, in the facility? We have about less than a minute. Yeah, they, uh, they, you're probably looking at the rice uh, patties in there. They had rice. They also grew wheat. They grew uh, grain for themselves and for the animals. They had pigs, chickens, and goats in there. And uh, so there was a, a complete, they had something like 150 different cultivars they could choose from in the way of beans and rice and all the different things you might uh, want to grow for human beings. Yeah, and I see this uh, analytical and also we now have the uh, air handling uh, system up. I'm going to leave this uh, image up as far as the uh, Biosphere uh, 2 uh, looking at it from a, a distance. What, did, what are some of the couple of things that we really learned from this experience and we've got about 30 seconds? <laughs> well, as I said, the recycling of water was a big thing. But just being able to apply what we learned in there of wastewater treatment and water recycling and air purification to, uh, to uh, human communities on the outside, I sure. that would be Can we do it in Eco Villages now, Phil? Oh, sure. Piece okay, <laughs> thank you, Phil. This is uh, Dr. Philip Hawes, SFIA, architect for Biosphere, coming in by uh, telephone, and our special guest, Christopher Zaloff, award-winning filmmaker and developer, First Eco District in Philadelphia. And uh, thank you for being with us as we look at something uh, that was, in a sense, very old, but very new as we create the Emerald Planet. Same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. I dare you. I dare you to change the world. Yeah, you. Getting that college education? I dare you to be somebody important. Like be a teacher. Or a reality TV star. I dare you to stand up here. To call the shots. To be a role model. An inspiration. An innovator. To be a teacher. Think you can change my life? Make me excited about science like you? Have a career that really means something? Then do it. I dare you. They say you don't have to be so strong. But this is my mother, my purpose. Strength is not optional. See, I lift her now like she raised me then. So I know my strength is super, but I'm still human. Well, look who's here. 
To the Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, and welcome to Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C., as we look around the globe for what we call the best of the best. Solutions that are making a difference in the 21st century, yet some of these solutions may come from the ancients going back thousands of years. Others were looking beyond the horizon about how do we adapt and at the same time to enhance the quality of living for a continent that will, and a globe that will soon have nine billion people. And so as we move forward towards 2050, we're looking at all the different ways and we're calling this the frontiers of ecological design. And my good friend and colleague is sitting right beside me. This is uh, Christopher Zeloff. He is award-winning filmmaker developer for the first eco district of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And uh, coming in by uh, telephone is Max Zainer. He is a lead fellow, architect, and co-working entrepreneur. That's a long title. What's called City Coho, a sustainability project in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And Max, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you, Dr. Sam. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. We're glad to have you. And uh, welcome from Philadelphia. I know that many good things are happening there, but tell us a little more about what's going on in Philadelphia and tell me about this uh, lead fellow architect and co-working entrepreneur. That's, uh, that's, those are all new ones linked together and how does that impact the work that you're actually doing there? Well, I, I sometimes refer to myself as a, a recovering architect, um, somewhat facetiously, but um, yeah, I'm up, I'm up to the things that I'm up to because really for some time now I've just been, um, you know, seeking, like, like you and your show are, seeking the kind of answers to, um, you know, what the world is facing currently. Um, the reason I'm up to what I'm up to, um, and, and to some extent what explains how uh, crazy I am in part is that I was raised by two psychologists. <laughs> Um, and so when I discovered a movement within the green building move, movement um, that was making the argument that how well a project performs ultimately comes down to interpersonal dynamics among not only the team members but stakeholders in the community as well, well, that just fit nicely with um, you know, my beliefs and the way I'd been taught to think. So now looking at this design that we like have that. here, Max, this is something that you've been doing, but it looks like uh, very green inside. You've got plants all over, but yet at the same time, it looks like maybe it could be a laboratory, grow lights uh, and uh, research tables and all. Tell us the mix of what we have here and what is this actually used for? Well, I believe the image that you have up um, is from the Rambo Land project. If you're on the first couple of slides there, that's correct. Um, the Rambo Land project is a demonstration project, actually in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, um, and it's a demonstration project that was initiated by a man named Ron Rambo, who is a citizen of Lancaster and has um, faced cerebral palsy all his life as well as the struggles that come with that that millions of Americans and many millions of people around the world face. So the Rambo Land Project is an effort that we've been working on to demonstrate how systems could be developed and designed and maintained differently to better support citizens in his position while also producing a surplus of other value streams like water, energy, food, and so forth. Uh, the, the project has a phenomenal world-class team and is currently projected to produce eight times as much energy as it uses, has incredible support from the city, so what we're going to be doing with water is going to be incredibly progressive and innovative. Um, and overall, subsequent phases of the project, we believe, are going to be a model for how cities can actually uplift and support all, all their citizens mm -hmm. better while actually healing the environment instead of damaging it. Yeah, and the whole thing about this too, Max, uh, looking at this building standing alone there, it's uh, surrounded in green space, very tranquil, uh, very lovely, uh, but the whole top of this actually looks like it's uh, 
producing its own electricity. Tell us about this yep. mix as far as uh, something that's very urban, but in some ways it's very rural at the same time. Yeah, it ends up looking a little bit that way. Um, and the reality is that those images are at the core of a city block in a low income neighborhood in downtown Lancaster. Um, it's surrounded on two sides by a solid um, string of row homes. And then on the opposite side of the street are mechanics garages, so on and so forth. But again, we want the house to be a demonstration of how space can be designed to be much more um, universal to citizens with all levels of mobility while the site and the, the overall block will be a demonstration of the way cities can and neighborhoods actually can shift to manage food, air, water, energy, and waste all very differently, creating huge surpluses. So you're right, it's a good, it looks a little bit suburban, but the reality is that's just kind of the angle that image is from, and it's actually in the heart of the city. Yeah, I know, it looks absolutely fantastic, and that's why I wanted you to describe it in great detail, and you did a very nice job. Thank you for that. Uh, Chris, you have a question? How you doing, Max? Chris hey, here. Chris. So Max, what's it gonna take for other developers to pick up on this and make this net positive the way we do things? Well, I, I think we need demonstration projects like these. The, the, one of the premises that has, and, and I, concepts that's come out of the Rambo Land project is um, that to some extent, sometimes the net blank, net positive, net neutral, whatever, terminology actually kind of hampers our thinking or can um, and so what we're looking at is just how do you optimize all the systems in concert and when you do that you get so far beyond net neutral um, and actually have an opportunity to create um, a different economic model that creates real resilience in low-income neighborhoods before you know you can get a construction loan based on fetching a certain level of rent. So I, I, um, I think developers are gonna have to potentially totally shift what they are focused on producing value around. If they're just focused on real estate, they're always gonna be gentrifiers at the edge of where banks will loan them money. But if they start looking at other value streams, maybe we can create resilience instead for those that need it most. Now, looking at this facility uh, from the inside, we look to the outside, uh, very modern yet uh, almost in a uh, the real bucolic uh, setting, but inside it's very modern, it's light, it's airy, it's open. Not something you think about would be in uh, inner city areas where uh, these kinds of structures actually need to be as people uh, bridge in these uh, legacy cities from you know the very old industrial model into the new, actually what we're calling the green model because you know the future green jobs, much of that's gonna be in agriculture and, and uh, some type of agricultural production. And that seems what you're doing here and also adding to yep. you know rainfall and all the other things that's very important for the environment. Yeah, and what you'll, what you'll see that's common as we progress through a couple additional slides there between Rambo Land and, and the City Coho project there is there is a similarity in aesthetic and part of that is because um number one as as an example of our thinking we've done this in many ways and with a lot of different systems but you'll notice you know in both cases for example we have polished concrete floors so we we first of all think they're gorgeous not everybody will necessarily but the great thing about a polished concrete floor in most cases is you actually eliminated dozens of materials from number one your budget and number two your breathing zone um, you know right now new new fully fit out spaces generally have around 8,000 chemicals in the breathing zone according to green guard and we don't know what most of those do to living tissue well we get out of worrying about that but just questioning do we really even need to add a bunch of chemicals to this floor or can we just make it beautiful the way it is that's you know that's kind of upstream thinking that we like to use because you know the reality is to this day the, for the most part the greenest material is the one you don't buy unless you're actually pulling something out of a waste stream and and avoiding a harm that it would have done 
That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you for giving us that summary. Looking at this uh, group meeting of City Coho, you have a great number of stakeholders uh, involved in this project, and yep. uh, it looks like they're very engaged in this meeting that we have here. How were you able to bring all these stakeholders together, and how are they now working together in order to improve these uh, inner city areas? Well, so our, our nonprofit, which is called Nexus, um, kind of recognized that um, we, that frankly, the, the sustainability movement, if you want to call it that, um, the social justice and environmental movements and economic responsibility all combined, to use the triple bottom line model, is not succeeding at the rate that we need it to. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, having learned some lessons from best practices and beyond in green building, we realized that the sustainability movement was demonstrating all of the indicators of disintegration of a disintegrated community um, so adversarial relationships between would-be allies gaps and overlaps in scope so on and so forth so we've set out to attempt to build a real community and, and functioning ecosystem out of the sustainability movement itself and step one is kind of getting them all in one room so we built the room and that's really what city coho is and now we're layering on top of that uh, you know, some more active serendipity um, cultivation. Yeah, Max, we need to be quick. I want Chris to have one more question. Okay. All right, Max, so I guess uh, it comes down to accelerating the process and make it a, a learning process. Um, City Coho, for instance, is a, is a model for communities. Is that what we can do to uh, build communities? I think that's a step. I mean, I think coming together good. with good process and good structure with, you know, resources that we can leverage is critical. Um, and again, I think in both cases with Rambo Land and City Coho, um, they're flowing from a, a particular mindset about not just systems thinking, but whole systems mm -hmm. and understanding how, um, you know, these interdependencies actually carry the promise for much greater financial stability and returns, not it's not this myth of sacrifice. Uh, Max, we're going to lose you right now. Uh, this is Mac okay. uh, Zion Nilesur. He's a lead fellow, architect, and co-working entrepreneur, City Coho Sustainability Project in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And my good buddy Chris Zeloff is sitting right beside me, a award-winning filmmaker and developer. And thank you for being with us as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet. Take a look under your bed. Find stuff under there? What about jobs? No? Now try your closet. Still no jobs? Just more stuff? Well, you really have both. See, stuff is defined as household articles considered as a group. Sometimes this stuff is no longer needed. Wait, no longer needed? That can't be right. Because remember those jobs you were looking for? Those are really needed. And they're the stuff inside your stuff. Our job is to unlock those jobs and it starts when you donate your stuff to your local Goodwill. Here's how we do it. When you donate to Goodwill, we sell your stuff to provide job training for people right here in your community. So just by teaming up with Goodwill, you help create jobs. And isn't that worth parting with the leftover guitar from your 80s cover band? Goodwill, donate stuff, create jobs. We, we just, just finished, finished dinner, dinner and, and it was time, time for homework. He I hates hate homework. homework. I know he's bright. Why is it so hard for me? He's I'm just trying as try hard as harder. I can. One in five children struggle with learning and attention issues. Go from misunderstanding to understood.org. It's me, Artie. Come see what I collected from the Creative Galaxy in my idea box. Transform your world. Will you help me make art? Each one of our journeys keeps us Before you throw it away. Hey, I have an idea. Think outside the box. Go be amazing! Give your cardboard box another life. Recycle. Most party fouls, not a big deal. But if you decide to drink and drive underage, you could lose your license and your freedom. Underage drinking and driving, the ultimate party foul.
to the Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome back to the Emerald Planet as we come to you as we look around the globe for those thousand best practices, technology, services, and products as we move through the 21st century. And as we say, we're looking for the best of the best, the solutions that are making a difference as we move forward and how we're going to provide the food, the fuel, the fiber, all the basic infrastructure as far as transportation, health, education, and the like. Because as we add two billion new people to the uh, globe, that we need to be actually enhancing their quality of life and not just existing. And the gentleman that is coming up is going to be talking about how we're going to actually take waste and turn it into very useful products, and it's called a waste to construction materials. And, but I want to introduce first my good friend and colleague who's sitting right beside me. This is uh, Chris Zeloff. He's an award-winning filmmaker and developer of the first eco district in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And then uh, Stefan Sharon is the partner of what's called the American Green Crete. We're going to talk about what that means. And also he's doing consulting of what's uh, with this GIS consulting. And this is for zero waste recycling program, both very important as we move through the 21st century. And Chris is sitting right beside me. Glad to have you here all the Pleasure. way from Philadelphia. And Stefan, uh, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Well, thanks very much, Doctor. Good to be here. Glad to have you here. Tell us a little bit about your background and what uh, drew you into uh, Green Creek and, uh, and actually wanting to do something about taking waste and still putting it in the landfills or just burning it to actually uh, have useful products that are needed for modern society. Sure. Well, thanks. I, uh, I tell you, I, I lived in the Virgin Islands in the mid 80s. And there's nothing like living in a small location like that where you don't have the uh, access to the neighboring county. Or the, you know, you dial 911 doesn't really help you sometimes in small places like that. And one of the things you learn to do is collect your rainwater reserve. Ever. Very expensive to truck it in, and uh, you become very conscious of the waste that we typically have in your average suburb or inner city and what have you. So I became acutely aware of that at that time in the early 90s when I went just back to school. Uh, what I found was something that actually was touched on by the last speaker. Which presentation I was thoroughly enjoyed is we just are struggling to admit the fact because especially here in the West we have such large S certainly there are phenomenal folk like yourself trying to do things but people just don't really count and look at it and I was stunned you know 120 gallons per person a day of water when we have so little potable water and uh, and then I found that there was there was disintegration back then, right around the time of the first um, Earth Day, if you will. Uh, even then, and we had to, there wasn't enough concerted effort like we see today. It's a very exciting time. Certainly, there were a lot of people who'd made efforts. And, and so, about every ten years, I've wound up somehow becoming involved in something that, that was along these lines. But it's never been so hopeful as it is now, and spe specifically relating to green creek. So I worked through a plastic recycling product called Ray Luma out of Germany. Phenomenal. Every bit of plastic you can find, you can manufacture a, a solid building product. They use it to, for rail ties. Yeah, looking uh, at what product. we have here, uh, Stefan, uh, yep. we're looking uh -huh. at different yes, kinds of uh, solid waste materials. Uh, a lot of it is plastic, mm -hmm. but there's metals in this, even uh, packaging. So how can you take all of these disparate things and put it together as far as uh, turning something into concrete, uh, which is very strict as far as, you know, weight loadings and uh, the uses of it, uh, you know, fire codes. I mean, it, concrete faces so many different uh, barriers, restrictions, and regulations. So how can you just use this and then put it into something like concrete? So that's the exciting thing when I see these technologies merging. So a fellow named Johnny Taylor, uh, was a salvager, worked for over 20 years to develop a method. And, and where oftentimes people miss the mark on recycling and what his his process does is it takes the feet in horizontally instead of vertically. So it's not rushing things through and then it's got a very high power 
slow moving set of uh, highly defined shredding devices, these wheels, and it pulls it through at such a speed, it, it pulls rather than it being dropped through, that the output is uniform. And so in some processes, you have big chunks and small stuff. And if you apply a little heat, some of that burns up and you wind up with output uh, into the atmosphere or some things don't mix in. And his process allows you to have a starting point, a material, a post-consumer product that actually replaces the, the rock part, the ABC, uh, the river rock in your concrete. So it reduces the weight to about 51%. And it adds a level of energy absorption. It allows you to drive a nail into it but if you hit that wall with the same hammer, it, it, it doesn't break like drywall would. Yeah. So 100% looking, of the trash, it comes in. Yeah, looking at the material, we've got uh, shredded glass. We're looking at PVC pipe, uh, fiberglass shreds and all that. And then something was most interesting that you were sharing with me is that uh, you're out in the West. Uh, you have a lot of casinos out in that area, so they're constantly refurbishing themselves. Is that taking the old carpet and pelletizing that and then putting that into the uh, concrete uh, really is ideal because it's it, almost like it's interlacing itself uh, within the structure of the concrete. So tell us about that, how using this material really does help reduce the th load on the environment and increase the strength of the concrete. It, it sounds too good to be true, uh, honestly, um, it, because we're able to strip the top off the top of that carpet, run that through the same device as taking those other products. And, uh, and we're not talking about the west, well, the wet waste. There's training that has to be done where uh, people's hamburgers go in one bin uh, we can dry those out, we can address and use them. We, we took 100%, Johnny took 100% of the trash from the 19, I'm sorry, the 2015 Super Bowl and was able to, to uh, utilize that. And so what we find is an amalgamation of all the different forms of trash that are made into such a uniform size through the application of pressure and a wee bit of heat. Uh, it, it actually produces a component that can go into concrete, allowing that concrete to be uh, actually sustain greater pressure without splitting or crumbling. Uh, it's fireproof. It doesn't get moss. It doesn't get uh, rot. And critters don't get into it. It's like building with concrete. Absolutely fantastic. Chris, why don't you ask a question? All right, Stephen, good to see you out there in the Wild West. Good to see you, sir. So the Wild West has a lot to teach us, and the Nipton Project certainly is part of that building an eco village and there's a symposium coming up. Um, what can you say about Nipton and how new learning is going to be facilitated? And when you get out west, it's a completely different world. Well, it is it's very different from you know, my six years in Manhattan, I can assure you. Uh, but in other ways, it's very similar in terms of personal responsibility. And there's no better model or location than the West out here. It's a very unforgiving environment. If you forget your water when you walk into the desert, you can't just pull into a mini mart. And, and uh, living out here is the same. So the opportunity to bring together people from, uh, you know, such heralded pasts as, say, Talia some West or Arcosanti, uh, several, you know, Biosphere 2, a lot of great minds who are able to look. You know, I see great things coming out of uh, Israel and Japan's had fantastic uh, opportunity, typically places with limited resources like we have out here. So finding a way to live on 30 gallons or less of water daily, finding a way to uh, grow appropriate food, zero scape and, and use 100% of your trash while producing actually 10,060 BTUs of energy uh, are all things that lead to a degree of sustainability that we're simply going to need. So it's a, I think it's an exciting location and a time to be involved in these discussions and have a product that we believe we can contribute to the significant changes as zero waste be, goes into the landfill going forward. Yeah, this is something interesting. I'm looking at this and you know, you and I were teasing each other back and forth on the uh, telephone earlier about uh, the type of equipment we have here. Uh, little did I know that you can actually take all of this equipment into a small community and virtually recycle 100% of their solid waste. Doesn't go into the landfill. You separate out the things that actually Correct. can go on the land uh, used as a fertilizer or humus. And uh, so this is really Compost kind of a portable uh, 
a waste processing stream. This is really interesting and I've not seen this before. So tell us a little bit about what we're seeing. It was, it was designed specifically for that because there are small communities and that's part of what the Nipton project is, is how do, uh, you know, there was a, uh, we were 80% rural 130 years ago and 20% urban and now we're probably what, 10% rural? And uh, people are discovering they'd like to live in, in these, uh, go back to some of these communities. But it's hard to have commerce and work and the necessary jobs. So it turns out the very products that say they drive into, from here we drive into Las Vegas, we generate paper bags and cups and all the usual consumer items that we have. And then it just trucks away and we pay somebody to truck it away. When, when you complete that economic circuit and you actually turn it into a post-consumer good, now I'm hiring people to put in sidewalks in the town with the very same money I would have paid to have that trash hauled away. Yeah, I say so it's the just the economic dyna dynamic that it brings. Yeah, it's just amazing uh, looking at uh, what you're actually producing out of uh, mostly trash and uh, putting it, you know, right into uh, back in, as you're saying, back into service could be sidewalks and uh, can be pavers. But the thing that's really interesting is how this actually does not burn, and so that meets a lot of the safety codes that you need. Uh, now we're uh, over 80% urban in the United States, so people are living uh, closer together, more yeah. compact, and so the right. threat of fire and uh, you know the natural disasters at the same time is really increasing. So it's amazing the product that you've created out of this. So looking at these properties, uh, how are the city code fathers looking at this particular product? Well, we've been uh, growing uh, through working with people who have accepted, uh, acceptable products. So, you know, for instance, <coughs> the test you saw there, the Phoenix Fire Department ran uh, 490 degrees of directed heat 15 minutes on a 12-inch cube that was uh, just over an inch thick. And the temperature inside never got above 80 degrees. And at ASU, they hung a 12-inch square that was a half-inch thick for 29 minutes at 115 degrees, and it lost one ten thousandth of a degree. So we're talking about something with an R factor that degas twice, is flexible, doesn't crush, and because it's being removed from the landfill process, we can build a house for about. Stefan, we're going to lose you. Equipment. Sorry, uh, this is Stefan Sharon. Not a He's the uh, partner for the American uh, Green Crete and consultant, CIS uh, Consulting Zero Waste Recycling Program. Chris Zoff sitting right beside me. And uh, thank you for being with us as we look at these amazing products that are coming on the horizon to deal with solid waste and building construction at the same time. with summer vegetables and pesto. Enjoy. Okay. How we doing? So what do you got going on underneath that plate there? This food is really about to be thrown away. Yeah. Really? Is there, is there something wrong with this food? Where did you get it from? From farmer's markets. They put aside the ugly vegetables and the ugly fruits. Carrot yeah. top, soft avocados. It was all food that was going to be discarded. Even the drink you had is made from like a little bruised peach. Did it taste a little it's like bruised? Great. It's good. The average person throws away 24 pounds of food a month. That's a lot. Isn't that a lot? Go visit savethefood.com for more information. Thank you. Junk food time!
to the Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe for those thousand best practices, technology, services, products, and the processes that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And of course, we're looking for the people, the real leaders that are uh, looking for the research, the technologies, the innovation, the sustainability factors that go into how we're going to actually uh, draw from the past, but keep moving into the future as we explore uh, under the oceans and into outer space, but yet right here on planet Earth itself. And I have a gentleman who's been doing a lot of that, and uh, he's a uh, real pioneer in many different ways. This is Christopher Zaloff. He is award-winning filmmaker and developer, first eco district up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And uh, we're talking about the frontiers of ecological design, and you have something called education, uh, exploring the future of design. What is education? Tell us about that and how that fits into the scheme of where we are now, but where we're heading into the future. Well, education is a film about to come out. Actually, it's in a rolling release right now. And um, just like it says, education, we're trying to find the edge of the educational process. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to transform the dumbing down process into the Renaissance, Renaissance mind producing process. Mm -hmm or what's called normative planning process, and hopefully to plant the seeds for a new collective intelligence to uh, arise as well. So it's a tour de force through new ideas in design. That's fantastic. This City 21, this is something you and I have talked about over the, uh, the last few years. How does that fit into this education and how do these meld together as we're moving forward into the future? Well, that's a good question. I made a film called City 21, Multiple Perspectives on Urban Futures back in 2009, and before that a film called Ecological Design, Inventing the Future. And they dealt with a lot of technology and a lot of new planning ideas, but at the core you have to get to the educational issues, and so it's kind of a completion of a, of a trilogy in a sense. And so this is getting at the roots of our challenge, which is changing our educational process from external conformity to project-based learning and finding ways to produce Renaissance minds similar to the founding fathers that brought forth this country. Mm -hmm. What is the process of doing Yeah, that? and this is something, uh, this is a design that you're actually proposing for Philadelphia, but it could be any legacy city. It could be a brand new city that could be built anywhere on the planet. But we're looking at uh, the green space as vertical, not just as horizontal. And so as we look at this, how does this new design where one flows into the other, and at the same time, it's doing all the things we need as far as addressing the environment, but providing food, water, and all these other basic necessities that is going to become more and more expensive and uh, maybe even scarce in the future. Well, you're kind of jumping from the cinematic world to the built world, which is okay because I like to do that myself um, as they do bleed together in a cinematic universe in a sense. But vertical building is part of this movement towards net positive environments where our buildings give back more than they take. And thing is, we can create density at the vertical level that's not as easily created at the horizontal level. Mm -hmm. So it's a new design philosophy that comes out of an education kind of thinking mm -hmm. and a City 21 kind of thinking. Yeah. So they are connected, but uh, and then that's the bleeding that I guess my work gets into between the cinematic aspect and the actual built environment. You know, the whole thing is we have to have things that are very practical as we go to 9 billion people on the planet. We may have 12 to 13 billion by the end of the century. 
So uh, we can be cinematic, we can, uh, you know, have the, the philosophy, but at the same time we need to care for people because they're going to be on this planet whether we want them or not. So two billion new people by 2050. So looking at this image that we have right here in front of us as far as this blending of the horizontal and uh, vertical, what are some of the things that are actually transpiring here uh, in this because uh, People are saying is that food is not going to be necessarily outside of the city boundaries, but it's all going to be growing in a either outside or inside these buildings in, in a ver vertical phase. Well, that picture certainly shows a regenerative environment. Certainly food production becomes part of our everyday life and can be integrated mm -hmm. into our buildings and into our streets to some degree. But the idea of a... Uh, living environment that uh, is something that we participate in and help co-create. That's mm -hmm. a shift as opposed to an environment that we just consume. Of course, there's technologies like green walls and solar energy and geothermal and vertical growing of plants. These are all uh, approaches to getting towards a post-petroleum understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting uh, looking at this, Chris, where we have the juxtaposition of, you know, these green walls, actually the green street and, and the walls, and then we're moving into a very, what we consider urban landscape. You kind of see the haze that's in the sky here, and you're asking this question, Philadelphia's first eco-district. So looking at, uh, you know, what you're actually doing and uh, looking at this edge you uh, education, how does this fit into this new uh, eco-district that you're really talking about and want to produce? Well, an eco-district is a place where you bring all the ideas together at the neighborhood scale mm -hmm. where people live, work, and play. And so you bring in public art, you bring in green technology, you bring in solar energy, you bring in conversations and meeting places, not unlike a city coho, a co-working space mm -hmm. becomes part of it. So you're dealing with the actual ecosystems as well as the human ecosystem mm -hmm. and you're integrating them together. And so you're dealing with some of the atomization that's happened in this uh, recent uh, civilization with television and technologies that keep mm -hmm. us from interacting. So it's it's a new way of building community and it's a way of uh, moving towards a regenerative uh, condition, which we don't have many examples of. Mm -hmm. but yeah, but we're, we're getting it just like Washington, D.C. claims to be have the, uh, the most square foot of uh, green roofs right. in the United States. Actually, they claim the world. I'm not sure about that, but definitely in the United States. But looking at this streetscape, these are very classical industrial buildings uh, coming from the legacy uh, Philadelphia, but yet you see all this green on the uh, the streetscape you have here, new trees, you've got the bicycle trails, and then you look at the top of the roofs and we have all this growing material, mm -hmm. uh, possibly, uh, you know, both herbs, vegetables, uh, maybe even flowering uh, crops up there. How does all this blend and how do you see this, Chris, is, of uh, all of this really addressing the issue we have of making the cities much softer, uh, more livable, and actually, again, you said early on is that the buildings and the, the, land, the scape around us, the design, is giving more than it's taking. Right. Well, I think we're reaching a point of cultural exhaustion with our current paradigm of development and our current reliance on fossil fuels. So we need a new mythology. Mm -hmm. We need a new ideal of the urban environment. And so this is an example of something to look forward to. And so uh, it's part of this design revolution that's been going mm -hmm. on for 30 years, and it's just integrating it into old buildings is one way of doing it. In Philadelphia, that's New York, for instance. Mm -hmm. All these buildings can be brought uh, to life uh, through the various green technologies mm -hmm. that are out there, green, green walls, solar energy, um, green roofs, waterscaping, these are all technologies that are rather robust and mature mm -hmm. right now. So the challenge is to 
get our collective imagination to move us towards that. And of course, developers and city planners and the code people and the bankers and the consumers, wrong word, but the uh, uh, people involved in everyday life mm -hmm. need to start uh, getting involved mm -hmm. and helping this to happen as we are in a point where we cannot continue our old ways anymore. We're at this bifurcation point. And it's back to the image of the future. This is a positive Im image of the future, mm -hmm. and cultures rise and fall based on that. Yeah, and I, so, would, I uh, would agree with more that. More of the same isn't going to work, and we can't continue our dependence on, on now, fossil Now let's go to fuels. this bioremediation barge. What is a yeah. bioremediation barge, and how does it fit into the overall scheme as far as being able to make the, the cities more responsive, to make them softer, uh, but yet enhance the quality of life actually the life force of people and all beings, whether they're living in the soil, living in the air, or you know, among human beings and plants. Well, that's a project that came out of the film Ecological Design, Inventing the Future. Two main characters, John Todd and Jay Baldwin, who built that model there. That's the pillow dome technology and the cleaning of the water technology is mm -hmm. called solar aquatics or Living Machines, that's John Todd invention, and that's bringing it together into a barge that would actually clean the river, be a classroom for the universities, and also produce aquaculture for feeding the city. So it's one of these vernacular projects that uh, plants the seeds for a new way of interacting with the environment. Mm -hmm. That would be along the Schuylkill River. Uh, the model was built by Jay Baldwin over uh, 15 years ago. The first one was built on the Danube in uh, Hungary, and can we do it in Philadelphia? As you notice, we're asking the question heuristically, can we build the first eco-district in Philadelphia? Can we build the first bioremediation barge? Mm -hmm. um, well, and you have the students. Yeah, you have the students here that are very much involved in this, and so you're involving uh, today the really the leaders of tomorrow and that's, uh, that's very, very important. So uh, through these areas here, what do you see for them in the future? Well, we got we to set the uh, game plan and the framework for these designs to happen at an accelerated pace and uh, stop the log jams of bureaucracy. And that's the big challenge as I see it, as well as to get the development community to realize Invest in the future, not more of the same. This is Christopher and, uh, Zaloff, award-winning award uh, filmmaker and developer, first eco-district in Philadelphia, as we create the Emerald Planet. <laughs>